Hello everyone and welcome to WASP 101. I'm Andrea Rossi, the developer of WASP. This series of tutorials is taught to introduce you to uh, using WASP as a tool to model discrete aggregations in Grasshopper. I'm gonna go through uh, the basics of using WASP for this task as well as try to show you some of the more hidden features that may not be super intuitive from uh, just looking at the example files. In this tutorial I want to take a step back and try to look a little bit more in detail into what WASP rules are and how exactly they work. Uh, the idea is that while in the previous tutorials we just used the rule generator to calculate all the possible rules, it's very important for a design process based on discrete parts to understand how to select and define rules in order to generate the outcome we want. We are going to see how by just manipulating the rules that we provide to the aggregation, it becomes possible to already achieve a, high a very high differentiation on the final results, which you would not expect uh, from just giving simple parts and simple rules. So what is a WASP rule? A WASP rule is a very simple statement in the form that you can see uh, on screen where we can define how two parts have to be connected together. The, a WASP rule has two sides. So the uh, left side, which you can see in this case in purple, is the side of the part that is already placed inside the aggregation. So in this case, part A would already belong to the aggregation and we would be selecting this part as the uh, site for the placement of a new part and we would choose the connection A uh, small uh, as the place where this connection would connect. So once we define where we want to place the part, we actually have to decide where which new part to place and how to place it. The way in which we define that in this case is we define that uh, we are going to use a part like the part that is of type B and we are going to be connecting it with the connection B. When we uh, combine these two together we have a very simple and compact statement that defines how an each step in an aggregation can be calculated. Once we are running a um, stochastic aggregation as we've been doing before, what the algorithm is going to do is that it's going to choose at every step uh, one connection, one uh, sorry, one part that is already placed in the aggregation, run through the available rules and find the one that are compatible with this part, and then pick a new part according to what's specified by the chosen rule and attach it to the already placed part uh, in the aggregation. To demonstrate and explore a little bit how uh, different rules and different configuration of those rules can lead to very different results, we are going to be working out of the file from uh, tutorial number two. If you haven't been following along or you haven't done tutorial number two, you can find the file in the download link in the comment box below. And what you're going to find in there is you're also going to find two files, like the complete file for both Rhino and Grasshopper and a file that is tagged work file, as you can see here, which is the one we are going to work from. This is exactly the example file we built in uh, the file we built in tutorial number two. So if you follow along, you can just go from there. And what we want to do is we want to explore how such an aggregation can be driven to create very different results. Uh, by simply changing the rules. Uh, we are going to go on and first of all go towards the end of the definition and switch from detailed geometry to base geometry and that's going to allow us to work faster and to compute the aggregation faster without slowing down our system and then we are going to come at the rule generator. In this case what we have been doing is uh, for the for the previous example is we have been using a rule generator which does nothing else than getting all the possible uh, rules, all the possible combination of parts and connection and generating rules uh, to combine that. Since we want to explore a little bit more exactly how rules work, we are going to go on and delete this for now. And we are going to start defining our rules manually. The way we are going to do that is we are going to see that there are two components to define rules. The most basic one is the WASP rule, which honestly I never use, but let's just take a look at it for the sake of doing it. And what this component does is it's very simple. It allows you to define exactly the four uh, elements of a rule. You can define what's the 
already placed part and the connection on that part and what's the new part to be placed and the already uh, the, uh, the connection to use for placing it. Let's go on and try one example. For example, let's type create a panel and type EXA, which is the name of our hexagonal prism. And let's say that we want to connect on connection 1, for example. And then we are going to define the second part, which we want to connect to this already placed part. And that part is going to be, for example, our cube. And we are going to connect to the connection 0 of our cube. Uh, WASP, like a little note, WASP uses uh, zero padded numbering, which means that the first connection in the part is the connection zero, the second one is one, and so on. Now if we see what we have in output, we see that we created a rule that is formatted in the standard formatting of WASP, which is x1 to cube zero. If we get this rule and connect it to our um, to our rule generate to, to our aggregation, and then press reset, something happens. We see that we are actually performing that rule, meaning that we are placing an hexagon and then attaching the cube over it, but after that the uh, aggregation stops and we get a little message balloon and if we click on it, it tells us that it could not place 248 parts out of the 250 we demanded. The reason for that is one of the most important and often misunderstood uh, things about WASP rules. WASP rules are by definition directional, meaning that the rule that I define here, which goes from exa to cube, it allows to place a, to attach a cube on an already placed hexagon, but it doesn't allow the opposite, it doesn't allow to place an hexagon on an already placed cube. If we want to allow that to happen, we have to create a second rule which is the inverse of this. Now, you can understand that creating rules like this is a little bit laborious and for this reason I created a more compact way to do that. If we go to the rule tab and get wasp rule from text, we have a component that allows us to convert the text string directly into uh, a rule. Let's go on and uh, bring in a panel. And as we want to type multiple rules in here, we are going to right click and select uncheck multi-line data. In this way, every line we type is going to be uh, one, uh, one separate data entry. And we can start typing some rules. For example, if you would want to recreate the same rule we created here, we can go on and type exa and then generate this vertical division line, one, underscore, cube, and again vertical line, zero. For example, x2, uh, two, two, let's connect an hexagon to an hexagon, x0. Uh, okay, let's for example try with these two rules. If we connect them you can see that they get automatically converted into a rule and then we go and we connect them to rules and we press the reset button and we see what happens. We see in this case, nothing happens. They'll try to reset again. And in this case, something happens, but again, after a while, it stops. So what happened in the previous case, like in this case, is that WASP, uh, in its first step, always picks a random part to uh, start the aggregation from. In this case, it picked a cube. Of course, there's a 50% chance of picking each of them. It picked a cube, but we have a problem. There is no uh, a rule that contains cube in the left side, which means that there is no rule that allows to grow from a cube. In the other case, let's try to press a bit till we hit the other one, we are using these two rules that allow to place, connect x2 to x0 and x1 to cube, but this is a, a set of rules that create a closed loop, because x2 will connect to 0 and will exhaust all the all the available connection and x1 will go to cube but then from cube we have nothing else to grow. To expand a little bit more let's try to add some more rules. In this case let's try first of all to add a rule which has cube on the left side for example cube 0 to x0 uh, and 
then let's add another one with connect cube one no let's leave it like now let's see if this is gonna now help us if we press the button it grows a little bit more but it seems it's still getting stuck okay let's try again let's now try to have cube connecting to a cube so let's say cube cube one to cube zero let's now run this and once again as we have a possibility of going from cube to x uh, and so on we should well, since the cube zero gets exhausted by always connecting to the hexagon, we get this expanding pattern and again the hexagon gets stuck. We can try to reset again and we see that if we start from the cube we get something different, but still. What we want to do is we want to add another connection between the hexagons. For example, x1 to x0. And now we see that we create this more complex element, but we never have a rotation, and we have never never have a rotation because we have we are just using cube cube one to cube zero, but we don't have a connection between that goes from cube one to x. Let's add that. So let's go and say cube one to x two. Let's reset. And there we go. Now we finally start generating uh, more complex aggregations. We can do all kind of experiments here. We can start, for example, removing the connection between the two cubes. And now what's going to happen is that the cube will not be able to connect to itself, but will always drive the hexagon to twist and so we're going to have all these hexagon to hexagon connections and then occasionally have twists and this will start growing out of plane Can try expanding this and so you see that every time I reset I get a completely new aggregation but we can see that there are certain similarities so this idea of creating like flat elements and then having cubes connecting that and that's because the rule set we're using is the same and so even if the process that aggregation is using is completely random the results that we get out of it are somehow similar uh, what of course what's very interesting is that we still have our whole detailed geometry being computed and so on at any time we can go back and switch and visualize how this looks like Great. Let's lower again the number and go to 250 in order to have a faster computation and also not a huge aggregation. And now let's talk about what we used before, which is the rule generator. Let's move these rules we wrote a bit lower and let's go to the rules tab and get a rule generator. Now if we connect this to part and then this to rules and reset we get it another sort of result so what we get out of the rule generator and we can see it by placing a panel is that we get all a set of rule which contains all the possible combinations of all parts and all connections so if you look you see that first of all I'm gonna have all my extra parts on the left side and I start with connection 0 and connect it to all the other available connection on exa and then on cube then I go to exa 1 then I go to exa 2 and then I switch the other way and I go to cube now that's a very fast way to generate aggregations and test what happens with your system however it's not necessarily the most controlled one because you don't always necessarily want to connect everything to everything so how can we uh, change that how can we control what the rule generator creates well the first two uh, controls that we have on the rule generators input is the two inputs self p and self c what self p and self c 
respectively do is that they allow a part to connect to itself on a con or a connection to connect to itself. By default, they are set to true. And we can see here that hexagons connect to hexagons and cubes connect to cubes. But we can go and place a Boolean toggle and change them. So if I place a toggle, Boolean toggle, and connect it and say that now parts are not allowed to connect to each other, and I reset the button, all of a sudden I get a very different aggregation. And the reason for that is that is the aggregation has to constantly switch from one cube to an hexagon to a cube to an hexagon to a cube to an hexagon to a cube to an hexagon, and it's never allowed to create that. And we see that the list of generated rules is much shorter because we have just the hexa going to cube and the cube going to hexa and not the other way around. If we further create a second toggle and connect it to self C, we see that the rules become even less because rules, uh, connections that have the same AD are not allowed. In this case, if we reset, we don't really see a difference in this case. In this case of disaggregation, it doesn't really have an impact. But in this case in which um, certain connections would create a mirroring effect when being used against each other, you would see uh, some variation happening. Great. So here you see already how, by manipulating the way in which the rules are created, in this case, if I go back to allowing the same part to connect to each other, we have a very different looking result. And that's all because we manipulate the way in which this rule grammar is defined. Now, these two, while these two are quite interesting, they are nevertheless relatively limited. We can just decide it's a yes or no. Can a part connect to itself or not? And they are applied on all the rules and on all the parts. If we want to have uh, a finer control, we have to start looking into um, connection types. We see here that we have an input that allows us to enable the use of connection types. And in this case, we can, by default, it's set to false. So by default, types are ignored. But when we bring this and bring it to true, we see that at the moment, nothing changes. So you see, if I change this to false or to true, I have the same exact number of rules. And nothing changes because our connections at the moment do not have types. Now, how can we experiment how types would affect the result of an aggregation? Let's, for example, hide for a second all the grasshopper canvas. And we can do that by clicking on this little symbol here with this black eye. And if we go in Rhino, let's think now that we would want, for example, to have connections not only on our vertical faces on the hexagonal prism, but also we would want to connect top and bottom of this element. So in order to do that, let's maybe hide Rhino for a second, hide Grasshopper for a second, go to the layer and hide the high rest parts so that we don't have problems. And then we want to go on the EXA layer, on the connection layer. So we double click on it and activate it. And we are going to go on and draw a line that goes from one vertex to the opposite one on the top face. Make sure that the midpoint snap is activated. And the midpoint of this line is going to also be the midpoint of this face. Let's delete this line and let's draw the direction of this connection, which is going to be from this point. Oops, sorry, took a point from this point to the midpoint of the opposite side. Now we can do the same for the bottom face. We go, we draw a line, we draw a point, we delete that line. And again, we define the connection and you can experiment with whatever orientation you might want. In this case, I'm going to go to the next side compared to the top aggregation. And now that we define these two extra rules, I'm going to go forward and I'm going to get this cube part and move it a bit lower, as well as the attribute, move it a bit lower. And then I'm going to go 
on and import this. We are not going to use the same import that we already created, but we are going to create a separate component. We are then going to create a point component. Right click, set multiple points, and I'm going to choose the top first and the bottom as a second one. And then let's bring a curve component. And right click, set multiple curves, top curve, bottom curve. Now that we selected them, we can go to elements, connection from direction. We are going to connect our geometry, our centers, and our up vector. And then while keeping shift press, we are going to connect this to the connection input in order to have them added. Great, we can just select it and hide it for now. And then we can activate the grasshopper output again. And go on and reset our uh, aggregation to create a new one. And you see what happens. We created a huge mess. So what happens is that since we just added to connection and we have our uh, rule generator that creates rules that connect everything to everything, we have a very chaotic aggregation because square faces can connect to square faces, but they can also connect to hexagonal faces. And so we have this weird situations in which we have cubes snapping on top of the hexagonal faces. Now we don't want that. We want to add a little bit more control to uh, this aggregation and say that we want to allow only hexagonal faces to connect to other hexagonal faces and only cube faces to connect to other cube faces. Square, sorry. To do that, we can go back at the definition of our part here, our exa, and you see that the connection component has a fourth input that we ignored for now. This input allows us to specify a specific type for the connection. Now a type is just a text, and when we activate the type, uh, the use of types in the rule generator, we are actually telling the rule generator to connect only con to create connections between uh, to create rules between connection only within connections that have the same type. Let's go on and then say these are our first set of connections that we had at the beginning, and let's go on and create a panel and call them uh, square. So these are connections of type square. And these are the two that we created on the top and bottom of the hexagon, and so we're going to go on and call them hexagon. We also want to go further below in our cube. And we know that our cube has just two connections, and those connections are also square. So we're going to also create a panel and name it square. Be careful when you're creating these types they all have to match exactly. They have to be all either lowercase or uppercase. So if this square would be lowercase and this would be uppercase, they would be considered two separate types. Great. Now that we define these types, we can see that our rules became a bit less. And if we go on and reset our aggregation, we see what's happening. We see that our cubes are now connecting exclusively to the rectangular side of the hexagon and our hexagons are connecting both to the sides and also stacking over each other. Great. If we want to see what would happen without that, we can just deactivate the type part, press reset and we see again the mess we saw before. And then again now we can activate the types, check what's happening and then we can explore what happens when we deactivate and we say that parts cannot be connected together and then we are going to get again our big bubble and of course you're going to get no stacking because the hexagonal connections are just available between parts that are the same type. Of course as we said before what's awesome is that we can go back and go back to detail geometry. I'm going to hide whatever it's in Rhino and maybe move to Arctic mode to Arctic view maybe bring in a little bit more connections. And then once we did this, we can shrink our grasshopper and start exploring all the different combinations that we can create. I can activate the self P, reset, and get this very compact and very uh, directional 
aggregation. Okay, we're maybe gonna do a bit less so that it doesn't go that slow. I can remove the types, impress, and create this very chaotic aggregation. I can go back at the beginning and I can disconnect by keeping control pressed the uh, hexagonal connections. So in this case, those connections do not exist anymore. And then we can run this. And we're gonna get still this relatively chaotic aggregation, but with much more uh, space in between the parts and we get this flat arrangements of parts which then become uh, which then get twisted whenever we insert a cube part. So you see that it's very simple. We can also go back to our uh, rules, which we define and see what, what that leads to. And so you can see that by, ve by only varying the rules in a pretty straightforward and simple way, you can control the result of your aggregation. And I think this is really what's interesting about the, the use of the stochastic aggregation is that by using a completely random process, you can really understand what are the characteristics and the specific potentials which are given within your aggregation and within a certain set of rules uh, that are part of your aggregation. So I hope once again that this tutorial was useful and I hope that you will now be able to have a bit of a better understanding of how WASP rules work and explore um, how within your aggregations by changing the rules and defining them in different way, you can achieve very different results which have different aesthetic potentials but could also be have different performative and architectural application. Uh, if anything was not clear, please leave a comment and let me know. I'm happy to help you answer. If you want to keep updated with the, with the video series that I'm going to be releasing, at the end of the video you're going to see a little WASP um, symbol here. You can just click on that and subscribe to the channel. And for now, thanks for watching and see you in the next video. Bye.